Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a brief discussion, and we're going to talk about the economy. Now, there have been discussions about the economy. You can turn on the news. You can see economists. You can go to particular talk shows and television shows and news media programs and specials that are on cable network, and everybody will talk about the economy. They'll talk about investments and so on and so forth. Um, in the background, I'm looking for something, a particular recording. But let's go ahead and briefly, let's give a little bit of history. And as we give a little bit of history, we are going to bring to your attention as best we can what's been going on. And in immense time, I'm going to change the background on the screen to something slightly different than what we've been seeing and something that I haven't used recently. I think we can use this one. No, as a matter of fact, I think we'll use this one. I'm a sci-fi person, so we'll do that. Okay, while I'm doing that, I'm also going to be converting over to a different battery for the recording of this video. To bring to you all's attention what's been going on, there was a situation that occurred in 1933. Now, if you look at actual history and the recorded documents of Congress, you'll see that in 1933, shortly after the Great Depression, which pretty much didn't taper off until 1935 to 1938. But happening beginning at the beginning of 1937, there were signs, there were telltale signs, just like it is today. The banks were contracting the monies that were floating around in the system because like then, the same now, the financial institutions controls the flow of monies. And as long as they control the flow of monies, then they can control which direction you, I, or anyone else go in. So, at that time, with the control of the flow of money, the banks came together and they decided that they were going to restrict the access to currency in the market. And so what they did is they decided that they were going to, when people deposited funds, that they were going to release less funds into the economy. Well, we'll say economy for now because there was no economy prior to 1933. There was just a market, not an economy. There's an economy now because it was invented, created, it was crafted by design. Now, that design had already been put in place since the end of the 1800s. They had already planned on creating such an economy, but they could not because they had to create a crisis in order to get rid of the thing that was backing up the market. Because remember, the market was based on gold and silver. So they had to create something that would get rid of this thing that was interfering with them being able to control value, fluctuation, and how things were traded. So what did they do? Well, they introduced a plan. And that plan came with a letter from the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve Board sent a letter to President, as a matter of fact, I think it was, I don't know, I believe it was Hoover, if I'm not mistaken. See, I'm, I don't do the president thing that well, but it was the president before who was before Roosevelt. And as that president is leaving office and Roosevelt is coming in on March the 3rd, 1933, that president then gives that letter from the Federal Reserve. Now, you all have seen the letter, those of you who have paid attention to my videos. They gave that letter to the former president and now the new president coming in President so-called Roosevelt, they give him the letter. Now he takes that letter and he creates what's known as a proclamation. So he converts the letter into a proclamation which reads word for word, verbatim what the banks were saying. 
that there was this overwhelming influx of people withdrawing their money from the banks. And because the people were withdrawing, pay attention, because the people were withdrawing their money from the bank, that the bank were in fear that there would be very little money to pay off their debts and to pay off their other accountants. So what did they do? Well, it's quite simple. They actually did something very unique. They issued another proclamation through the president, ordering Congress to have an emergency session. See, Congress was not supposed to be meeting in March. March 3rd is when the president took office back in 1933. It wasn't in January, on January 20th. No, they converted to January 20th later. But at this time, it was March 3rd. So the very thing, very first thing when he gets in office, he issues a proclamation saying that because of the run on the banks, they need to convene an emergency session of Congress. So Congress obeys the president's order. That's right. The executive branch controlled the congressional branch. And they convened a special session of Congress. And everybody was there. Every single congressman, including Mr. McFadden, who was not a fan of the Federal Reserve, he tried, he did the best he could to bring to everybody's attention, wait a minute, hold on, the banks are doing something crooked here. We can't do this. This is wrong. That's what McFadden tried to say, to the point where they ended up voting him out of office. He was no longer a congressman after uh, that term. He tried to warn everybody, and it didn't work. So when Congress convened, they introduced this new bill based on the letter from the Federal Reserve Board and also based on the recommendation of the president, which was pretty much the exact same information. And lo and behold, we have the March 9, 1933 Act. And then we needed to sell this act. So you had the president going around telling everybody, hey, don't be surprised, everyone. It's a new deal. This one is new. And because we just said the word new, you'll think that it's not the old tricks. So here's the deal, everyone. What we're going to do is we're going to demand that you turn in all of your gold, any gold over a certain ounce, you'll have to turn in. You are not allowed to keep more gold or gold bullion beyond this amount. Anybody who does could face up to 10 years in jail, $10,000 in fine. It was called the fear of government. They put the fear of government into people and people turned in their gold. You also had some patriotic individuals who thought that they were helping the country by turning in their gold. And they were exchanging it not for legal tender. Federal Reserve notes are not legal tender. They can say it on the note all they want. Go back and read the notes of the March 9, 1933, second session of Congress. No, no, that was actually the first session. I'm sorry, the first session of Congress for the year 1933. You'll see that Congress authorized the use of Federal Reserve bank notes, FRBNs. Okay, Federal Reserve Bank Notes is what Congress authorized by the March 9, 1933 Act, not Federal Reserve Notes. Federal Reserve Notes are what's known as, now pay attention to the word, emergency script, because this was done under the Emergency Act, or what's otherwise deemed by the professionals as the War Powers Act, because it gave the president special powers during time of war. The act actually specifically says that whenever the president declares a national emergency, it references war. So they created this act. They only read it twice on the floor. The members of Congress did not get a copy of this act. They had a chance to read it just briefly. This hearing went on all day. It wasn't until 8.30 in the evening that they were actually passing that bill. They read it twice and then the senators had the vote. They had the vote on the bill. And there were a lot of threats against these senators if they failed to vote yes. Go back and look at the record and see how many of them kept their Senate seat or congressional seat after their vote. 
after that vote of no on this bill, well, you're asking, but how does this equate to an economy? Well, again, in the past, gold was the premise and everybody bartered and traded based on the value of gold. But now there was something different being introduced into the market, so to speak. What was being introduced was a new way of doing business. No, we were going to do everything on credit. You see, it's a credit-based economy. You'll hear it all the time. It's a market-based economy. It's a credit-based economy. The Treasury mentions it all the time on their website. When you look up legal tender status, it talks about commodities. Ladies and gentlemen, commodities. What's a commodity? Well, a commodity is a word that was invented, created. It's a financial legal term. So these commodities is what they create and they give it a value. Now, the reason why you hear about market value and value and so-called fluctuations is because they create these values. These are not actual values. These are created values. Go back to the 1920s, the 19, early 1900s, the late 1800s. Inflation? Unheard of. Go back and take a look. When things were backed by gold, go back and take a look at inflation. Why? Because the banks could not control the market. Well, now they control inflation. Now, if you don't understand how they control inflation, a month and a half ago, there was a cyber attack on an oil refinery here in America. And they're the ones who, quote unquote, are supposedly in control of distributing gas, refined gasoline throughout the East Coast month and a half ago. Apparently, the IRS said they caught the people and, oh, I'm sorry, that they recovered half the money and they put a stop to it. So no more data breach, no more getting into the system, no more ransom. Where? Well, then why are gas prices still 70 cents more than it was last year? It's not because of the summer. There's no crisis going on. So why are the prices 70 cents more, at least per gallon? than it was last year. It's because of inflation. The value of the dollar, because the government decided that it wanted to give out more legal tender. See, they flooded the market with this worthless currency. And now the market is starting to feel the effects of the worthless currency because there's no contraction. There's no restriction of the amount of printed paper that's coming through the United States Bureau of Engraving. There is no fluctuation of the amount. No, they're actually printing more. Why? Because the government decided that it wanted to give monies to people monthly, year after year, minute after minute. I'm told it's supposed to quote unquote run out. How can you run out of credit? when they're operating off the full faith and credit of the United States people. There are a couple of things that you all need to understand when they created this economy. They didn't create a new way for you to acquire goods. No, they created a different way. They created what's known as supply and demand. So they can curtail supply in order to keep demand up. And then they can curtail demand in order to keep supplies. And they've been working this system. That's why you have certain countries. Certain countries produce rice, corn, and other vegetables. Other countries produce automobiles or automobile components. Other countries produce packaging, boxing, food supply. They created a market, but an economy-based market. Why? Because each country specializes in certain things. Everybody knows that China specialized in, now they refer to it as cheap goods. Now they refer to it as cheap goods. But you notice they specialized in electronics, the same as Japan did for a moment. Then everything was made in China. Originally, it was made in Japan. Go back through the 70s. Datsun, Japan. Datsun, if you don't understand, was formerly, I mean, well, it was Nissan. So it's what Nissan formerly was, was Datsun. Then you had your Hondas. 
Now, Hondas, people considered them to be very fairly cheap cars, pretty much like Hyundai when it first started. But now that's not the case. And now look at South Korea. South Korea has just taken by storm with Samsung. And then you have the other electronics and automobile industries in those particular regions. Again, they created an economy where certain groups get to specialize. Notice how certain states specialize in certain things. What's the corn state? Hmm? Does anybody know what state grows more nuts in a literal sense and in a figurative sense than any other state? California. Do you know which state grows more vegetables than any other state? California. Why is this? Because that's the quote-unquote industry that the government created and that they fund with their subsidies. They promote this. Why? Because they want particular states to focus on particular things. We know that there were the motor cities, Detroit, where automobiles were produced. And then when that industry fell, there was nothing for those economies to fall back onto because they created an economy there. They created a means for people to have a means for working because that's what the New Deal promised. It promised jobs to people. That's why you see all these politicians continuing that cycle of promising jobs. That's why you hear congressmen and congresswomen talking about bringing jobs to their region. Why? Because they create industries. Well, when we ran out of natural resources, and we have run out of natural resources here in the United States, what did they do? Well, they started creating these industries. You had technology, Silicon Valley. Then you had the so-called truck driving industry, where you have all these companies offering truck drivers training. Then you had dental school, nursing school. Then you have now assisted living training. All of these are fields. They call them fields as if somebody's working in that field, they created these new fields where individuals can, quote unquote, earn a living. Now, why is this so important? Because many people are not getting it. We spoke about tax credits. A lot of people, and I will let you know that I had a conversation today with a tax agent, someone, and I won't be doing this often. I only, I've done it three times, such, no, four times now, where somebody said, if I called my tax agent, will you speak to them and explain to them everything? It's the fourth time I've done this. So I'm going to do it for you and basically give you guys the same conversation. You know, I wish I had the call recorded. Um, I believe I do, but I don't know if names are mentioned. And what I don't want to do is I don't want to put that person's name on the bulletin board so that everybody and their grandfather can harass that person by trying to call that person because it doesn't work that way because usually people are calling me asking me, well, can you give me the number to that person? No, because life doesn't work that way. As a matter of fact, I don't think life has ever worked that way, but we have people who think it does. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the way the conversation went. She says, I've been doing this for a while and I just basically am looking for you to explain Now, the individual, even though he says he did his research and everything, and I I will tell you, I told him I didn't believe him. And I told him the reason why I didn't believe that he did his research is because of the words he was using. See, ladies and gentlemen, if you do enough research, if you become an expert at the research that you're doing, then you start to incorporate the words of your research. You know, some of you, how you use legal terms. In your research and you talk to me and I have to stop you from using a legal term because I said you're not there yet to be using those legal terms. But that lets me know that you've done the research because you pick up the words and you start utilizing. See, I was going to say using at first, but then I stopped because the word utilizing fits better in that sentence. Now, that lets you know that there is a repertoire or variety of words, and I am very careful of how I utilize there's that word again, and speaking with people so as to convey the right thought. That's what I'm saying about research. You see, certain people doing certain research, for instance, when I hear people use HDR 192, 
I know that they haven't done any research at all. I know that they're listening to what somebody else said. Ladies and gentlemen, I just told you about the March 9th, 1933 Act. You didn't hear me talk about the House Joint Resolution that was the bill to get the act started. See, a House Joint Resolution is nothing but a bill. A bill is not law. It's just a proposal. That has to be accepted by both the House and the Senate in order for it to become law. And if it is a simple majority, fine, as long as the president signs it. If the president says, I'm not signing that, then it has to be a supermajority, which is two-thirds of the House and Senate. It happens all the time. They just did it this last December when um, Trump didn't want to sign the NDAA. But it was a two-thirds majority to override his veto. This happens all the time. And so that's how it's supposed to go. Well, in talking with this tax agent, she just said that she just needed me to explain the basics of everything that was going on. So I explained it to her this way, and I'm going to explain it to you all this way. What happens is there is a debt that is owed to a creditor. And the creditor sends out a notice that there is a debt that is owed and says you need to pay this amount. It's called a debt collection notification or letter. Well, the person who receives the debt letter becomes a debtor. In law, they officially, once they receive the debt letter, they become a debtor. Okay, that is the official term for that individual once they receive that letter. If they don't respond, then they remain a debtor. If they do respond, then they remain a person whose alleged debt is in dispute. It's just how the law is written. The law is actually technically kind of good for being written that way because it's all about capacities. Okay. So now the person waits past the three months, or excuse me, three months, the 30 days. The law requires that you only have to wait another 180 days. Now, from the initial day that you send out the letter, you have to wait not from the 30th day, no, but from the day that you sent out the letter, the date that that debt became due, you wait 180 days, six months. Once you wait six months, you send the other party notification. What is the notification you send? Is a 1099C. Why a 1099C? Because you're announcing that I'm canceling this debt. What do you mean you're canceling it? Why would you cancel it instead of making them pay for it? You're losing money if you just cancel it. No, because according to the new deal, I can cancel the debt and help offset the public debt of the United States. Wait, how do you offset the public debt of the United States by canceling debt that someone owes you? Well, because if I cancel it by doing a charge-off or a write-off, then I can elect to do a charge-off or a write-off. If I elect to do a charge-off or a write-off, and you'll see this on many people's credits, if I elect to do a charge-off or a write-off, then at that point, what I get to do is I get to go to the federal government on my tax communication with them, on my tax forms, they're designed for this. And I get to say, hey, Mr. Federal Government, I'm speaking to you through the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, and I am basically letting you know that I've written off this debt. Yeah, I'm not going to collect on it anymore, and they haven't paid in six months, so I don't think I'm going to collect. So what I'm going to need is I'm going to need credit from you. Now, this tax agent... These are the exact words of this tax agent to me earlier today. She says, well, no, 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 because if it's a debt that you charge off, well, that becomes a deduction. That doesn't become a credit. And I'm thinking, where are you getting your math at? How could it be a deduction? That's not a deduction. Let me explain to you why it's not a deduction. Because as we've talked about on debt that is owed to you, and we've done topic number 431 and 435 of the Internal Revenue Service, we have discovered that an individual gets to charge off that debt. 
Well, a charge off is not a deduction. It's not a deduction. It's a credit. It's an automatic credit, according to the IRC. We've given you the tax form uh, that has those codes and everything in it so that you can see for yourself. Because it's an automatic credit, then it's not a deduction. Because guess what you can't do with a deduction? What you can't do with a deduction is you can't carry forward a deduction. Go ahead and take a look. Go ahead. See, what you can do is you only have a limit that you can do. Well, they say, well, yeah, you can carry forward a deduction because the reason why you can carry forward a deduction because if you owe $100,000 in taxes, well, they only allow you to deduct $3,000. Well, then there's a problem because if I worked out a payment schedule with the IRS, then I would never have to pay them because I'll just use the federal deduction every year to keep paying them $3,000 a year. And I'll never have to worry about anything. You know, that's a good idea. Maybe I should arrange something like that. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason why this is not a deduction because the government gives you the credit for charging off your debt because now they get to reduce the public debt as a result of this gesture of your forgiving the debt. Now, here's the point that the tax person wasn't getting. I'm a creditor. Someone owes me. When they owe me, what I do is I say, hey, you owe me, you need to pay. Six months later, they didn't pay. Hey, I'm writing off that debt. I send them a 1099. It's the B section of the 1099. Now, she wasn't aware of the B section of 1099. That's okay. Because she hadn't done the research that I have, and I haven't done the research that she has done. Okay. You get the 1099B, or 1099C, B section of the 1099C form. And when you receive the 1099 B section of the C form, the IRS says you have to report that because it's counted as income. Wait a minute. How could that be income? Well, because I forgave the debt. Yeah, but you forgave the debt. That's not income for me. That's a benefit for you because you forgave. Oh, no, it's not a benefit for me because I just forgave the debt. Huh. Wait a minute. If you owe me $100,000, and I just forgive your $100,000, why would I do something stupid like that after only six months? Should I not be sending it to a collection agency and getting my money or getting to do the best I can to cause you as many problems as I need to? Or putting a lien against your property and going after my money? Why would I just charge it and write it off? Is there a benefit for me doing that? Ladies and gentlemen, of course, the banks receive a benefit from charging off or writing off a debt. What benefit is that? Well, it is quite simple. It has always been simple. It has never been difficult to understand this. See, the reason why they receive a credit or a benefit is the reason why you have to pay taxes on the debt that was forgiven. Because they received a credit. And because they received a credit, it has been theorized that that was a benefit to you, that that was income to you, and you're responsible for the taxes. Now, technically, if it was me, I would let them know, no, I'm not responsible for the taxes. The debt they forgave is the debt I paid. You see, if I got to pay the taxes on it, then if they forgave that debt and it's being counted as income, well, it has to be to my benefit. If it's being counted as income, how come it's not being reflected on my credit report? If I'm responsible for the taxes of this income, then my credit report must show that that income went towards that payment. So if I'm responsible for the taxes on that income, why are they taking my house? If I'm responsible for the taxes on that income, why are they taking my car? It is counted as income. So I didn't receive any income. Who received the income so that I am taxed on it? Are some of you getting what's being said here? The banks are not forgiving your debt for nothing. They receive a benefit. And because they receive a benefit, they have taxed the benefit because you received the benefit of them forgiving that debt. 
Because in a new economy, the credit-based system, pay attention, it's a credit-based system. If you receive the benefits of that charge-off or that write-off, because the banks receive a credit and they charge it off your debt on their ledger because it can only be done using the accrual method. Sorry, the tax preparer learned that little bit of information for the first time today. And every tax preparer that I've talked to did not know that in order for you to write off the debt and receive the credit and carry it forward, you must be on the accrual method. She even talked about how the government frowns on corporations not using the accrual method. Of course they do, because they invented the accrual method so that corporations can write off their debt so that they could help the government offset its books. Why? Because the government uses the accrual method, everyone. They invented the accrual method so that they, A-C-C-U-R-A-L, the accrual method, they invented that method so that they can Keep this economy functioning. She says, but if you do it, then they're going to cause you all kinds of problems. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't care about them causing me problems. What I care about is I have the right to do this. So please, like they say in the mask, somebody stop me if I'm wrong. A lot of people are afraid. Why? It doesn't make sense. If you have the right to do something, why would you be afraid? As I said, when you woke up this morning, did you have to ask permission? When you turned on this video, did you have to ask permission? So why are you afraid of doing something you have the right to do? Oh, because you don't understand. But then the information is right there. We gave you guys a whole sheet of the code that deals specifically with this information that we're talking about. And all you got to do is go to the, now we're not advocating, this is a SATCOM directed video, and so will the next seven videos be. So we're not advocating the EON channel on the SATCOM channel. What we're doing is we're placing this video on the EON channel and the SATCOM channel so that people will have this information. Let's get back to our discussion about the value of the credits and that the banks receive a credit. Now, again, the tax preparers don't know that it is a tax credit, although we have shown you that that's exactly the official wording for it. Any credit you receive resulting in a carry forward or a carry over credit is a tax credit. Now, however, if someone's debt is offset because it's counted as income, I want you to pay attention. It's counted as deferred income. I want you to pay attention because some of you are not getting this. If they foreclosed on your home, pay attention. If they foreclosed on your home and they wrote the debt off, you need to be challenging that as fraud because they cannot receive that credit and still foreclose on your home. That's putting you through what's known as double jeopardy and denying your right to due process. You need to file the complaints with the proper agencies, the CFPB, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, okay? And with the FCC, or is it FTC? FTC, Federal Trade Commission, and the SEC because they're trading the property on the market. You need to, don't worry about whether or not you win the complaint. You have to file it. Do a simple letter, simple affidavit. You literally are only explaining the who, what, when, where, and how. You don't have to go into complete details. You just have to make short, simple, sweet statements. Sign it. Keep a copy for yourself. Send it to the address of the agencies that I just mentioned. Then when they deny you or ignore you, give them 45 days only. Even put in your letter, I'm only giving you 45 days. There's no reason for me to give you longer than that for you to respond back to my letter letting me know that you're going to do an investigation. I don't care if there is a pandemic going on. After 45 days, then what you do? 
Real simple. You appeal. Just that simple. You appeal. Whatever decision, follow their rules on appeal. Don't worry about if the rules say you have to wait 185 billion days. File an appeal. After you file an appeal, then what do you do? Well, ladies and gentlemen, you keep that documentation. Then you file a claim with the insurance company or the agency. Okay? If you if it's a bank and you want to get the name of their insurance company, you call them. But they're not going to give it to you. So you assume, well, you still have to go through the motions. So you're going to call them and you're going to put it in writing. You still have to go through the motions. Now, I want you to pay attention. These are banks. They're FDIC insured. Someone we were talking today, and they were talking about the, um, oh, my stars. I don't think I'm going to be able to remember. And I apologize to you all for that. It is a certificate of participation. There is a mortgage-backed certificate of participation. Just look up the phrase, mortgage-backed certificate of participation for mortgage-backed securities. So certificate of participation for mortgage-backed securities. That's your beginning of your research. The two gentlemen that called me this morning, this was what they mentioned to me. And so while we're talking, I decided to look the information up and it was pretty interesting, the stuff that I did find in a short time that I did get to look it up. So that's what I'm giving you all right now. So certificate of participation for mortgage-backed securities. They have it for leases and mortgages and all this stuff. This is where literally need you all to pay attention. By doing a certificate of participation, many of you have been saying they haven't paid the taxes on this and that. Ah, because they're tax exempt. So those of you who the banks have charged off your account, you get a 1099C and they want to charge you the interest and the taxes on that, then you take their certificate of participation and give that to the IRS and say, I don't know you guys a thing. This was a tax exempt transaction because these individuals participated in this program and you, by law, cannot assess taxes on this. Ladies and gentlemen, that information should be a benefit to some of you. Well, let's get back to the economy so that you guys will understand what's going on. The economy is not based on substance. The economy is based on participation. Hold on. What are you talking about, Willis? The economy is based on your participation. You have to engage and participate in society in order to benefit from these new programs. It was called the New Deal. It's a contract. That's what a deal is. And nobody but a few people said that's a deal breaker turning in my gold. Okay, it is the new deal or the new agreement or the new contract. And you've all played in the arena. So don't pretend that you don't know that you've already consented, acquiesced as a result of assent via your conduct. Yes, you can say that you were duped. You can say you were forced. You can say that. But for right now, I am going to suggest to all of you. It's okay. Play the game. Wait a minute. It's okay. Play the game. It is a game. You just have to know the rules. And right now you don't know the rules, which is why you are stumbling. So it's a game. Everybody understands that now. Everybody gets it. But how do you play this game? Every debt you have, if You've lent money to someone and they didn't pay you back. You have the right. Send them a bill. Hey, I sent you a bill. You owe me. Six months later. Hey, don't worry about that. Now nah, I'm going to go ahead and charge it off. Just let you know. How do you do that? How do you let them know what a 1099C, the B section of that form? You keep the A, they get the B. Okay? That's how you give them notice that you have charged off the debt. Now that you've charged off the debt, you filed it on your taxes. 
Don't worry about somebody telling you you can't do this. Say, but I'm doing it this way. This is what I am doing because I have the right to do it this way. Unless you can show me where I don't have the right. Well, the normal practice, I don't want to do what people practice doing. That's how people get in trouble because they, they don't perfect what they're doing. They keep practicing. Well, I don't feel like practicing. I just want to go ahead and do it. And if they got a problem, then we can talk about it. I can do an affidavit letting them know that I'm going off of what I know the best to the best of my knowledge and understanding of the IRC. Because I'm not required to be an expert at the IRC, the Internal Revenue Code. I'm not required to be an expert at that. That's not law. I'm only required to be an expert at the law. Look, ignorance of the law is no excuse for everybody. So everybody is deemed an expert at law. Please understand that, but statutes are not law. So you're not required to know statutes, rules, or regulations. Pay attention. Those are not laws. So you're not required to know their rules. You're not required to know their regulations. You're not required to know their codes or ordinances or statutes because those are not law. The maxim is ignorance of law is no excuse. Not ignorance of rules, not ignorance of policy, not ignorance of procedure, not ignorance of statute, not ignorance of ordinances. Are you understanding? People say, well, you know so much. No, it's not what I know. It's logic. And that's all you have to do is use logic. Everybody knows that a statute is not a law because it's a statute. Everybody knows a rule is not a law because it's a rule. Everybody knows an ordinance is not a law because it's an ordinance. If it was a law, it would be called a law. Everybody knows that the statutes at large are not laws. They're statutes. Everybody knows, pay attention, that the Constitution is not a law. It's a contract. Go back and reread it. It's an agreement. That's why there's a limitation on government, and anybody who becomes a public servant agrees to be bound by those limitations. It's all logic. What is the law? Well, the common is the law. That's why it's called common law. If you don't believe me that they had every intent to make common law the law, go back and look at the Seventh Amendment. You know that there are rules for common law? What are those rules? Go back and look at the Seventh Amendment. They've never amended it or tried to amend it. When was the last time anybody's had a common law trial? Now, they say that they have suspended government since 1933 as a result of the new rule. Well, you know what they could not do, even if you agreed to it? They couldn't suspend the common law. They don't have the authority. Uh, oh, by the way, you don't have the authority either. Because that was the founding of this so-called wannabe nation. Ladies and gentlemen, there are some misnomers saying that they borrowed from Europe. They borrowed from England the common law. Please understand, everyone, that is a lie. England did not invent common law. Please, please, please work with us. England did not invent common law. England is not that powerful of a nation where they can go back centuries before they even came into existence and invent something for which they had no jurisdiction over. The common law has been around for millennia. The common law was practiced by the Jews. Go ahead and look at their law. Go ahead and look at the do to their neighbor as themselves. Go ahead and look at the, that was the whole summation of the law. Go ahead and notice that Britain was a country that founded itself on what they claim were scriptures. The common law is do to your neighbor as you would have your neighbor do to you. In other words, do no harm. You guys know the rule. There must be an injured party. Ah, so if you cause someone injury, you can be sued. If you cause someone injury, you can be put through the ringer of due process. There has to be an injured party. The two people I was talking with earlier today said the exact same thing. There has to be an injured party. No, ladies and gentlemen, wrong. They don't care about an injured party anymore. They just need a controversy. 
and that's where they are going from. They take only, pay attention, a portion of the Seventh Amendment, and they claim that that's what they're going by, that controversy. They're not taking the whole Seventh Amendment, just that portion, and claiming that that's the controversy for which they're relying on. It is one of those points where you say amazing. Getting back to the economy that was created, because the government is founded on the fact that they must balance their books. Now, they must have a balanced budget. The reason why the budget is not balanced is because you guys are not offsetting your debt. Now, you've heard it. The government says there's a common right of offset. It's a common law right of offset. You are not offsetting your debts because you're not using the accrual method. And if you use the accrual method, your books would balance the same as the bank's books balance. When they receive the credit from the government, their books are already balanced. They can apply to have the government issue those credits in a different format. It is not money. Refunds are not money, people. Refunds are credits. If you don't believe me, how do they refund your funds to you? Do they not issue you credits in the form of a so-called check? Do they not issue you credits in the form of depositing funds electronically in your bank? You guys don't get it. Bitcoin is not real. It's a credit system. The economy is not real. It's a credit system. All they're doing is giving people credit. It's just that they have put so many videos and films and movies out there making people think that a stupid dollar bill in the form of legal tender, in the form of Federal Reserve notes, is money. I'm sorry, everyone, because it never was money. If you don't believe me, Go back to the Treasury website. Look up legal tender status. You'll see that Federal Reserve notes has never been money. So the first point you need to do is understand, since Federal Reserve notes are not money, then what are these people talking about that are saying that I owe somebody something? Because you're not offsetting your debt. That's why you are a debtor. That's why your books remain off balance. That's why you remain off balance, because you have not been offsetting your debt. You've been creating a burden on society. Why have you been creating a burden on society? Because you're supposed to be discharging your debt. Go back and look at your infamous HGR 192, and then go look at the actual law statute at large. Go back. It's called the June 5th and 6th Act of 1933. That one will pull up. Um, I will pull up a web browser to show you that because many people are aware of it, but many people are not aware of it. So I will pull up the June 5th and 6th Act of 1933 for your benefit. But because they gave you a mechanism to offset your debt, you haven't been using it. Thus, you've been keeping the national debt where it is. That's the problem. We're going to just do June 5th. We're not going to do N6. So I put the June 5th Act of 1933. The reason why it's called the June 5th and 6th Act of 1933 is because it took two days to do this Gold Obligation Act. It is also called the Gold Obligation Act. That's the other official title. But for the most part, it's called the June 5th and 6th Act of 1933. So it's the June 5th Act uh, went off the gold standards. You'll see many websites that will talk about that. It's called the Gold Obligation Act. And let's see if anyone, see, these are all regular sites, but I would prefer a federal site. I would prefer a federal site and not, and this is the ignorance of individuals calling it HDR 192. But it's the, now this says June 3rd, 5th Act of 1933. No. Um, and it's the June 5th and 6th Act of 1933. And you can discharge almost no. See, ladies and gentlemen, you don't go to these sites.com and everything to find out something about the government because those are individuals and their opinions. Okay, go and take a look if you don't mind. 
go and take a look at the satcom911.com website, even the PDF section. Go and take a look, and you will see that at no time do we give you our opinion about any of this information. And we will not. We don't give you our opinion about trust agreements. The site is a trust site. So we don't give you our opinion because our opinion doesn't matter. Here's the thing. I am, and it's, I believe it is the, I don't think it was the 73rd Congress. Huh. I think it may have been then, now that I'm thinking about it. But what I don't see is the actual act. And I do apologize for that. You would think that it would be here at least once. So let me go ahead and pause you all for a second, then I'll tell you how, I, how I'm going to look for it when I come back. I'm sorry. It used to be readily available, June 5th and 6th Act of 1933, but now I can't find a single website, government website, that talks about the June 5th and 6th Act of 1933, specifically the Gold Arbogation Act. Now, they say that H.R. 193 or 192 had been overturned. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter if H.R. 192 has, has been re overturned. What is the case is that the actual statute at large, which they claim is prima facie evidence of law, has not been overturned. Go ahead and take a look at all the records and all the books and see that the actual original act for which was created as a result of H.R. 192 has not been overturned. You'll hear the Supreme Court talk about H.R. 192, but they can't because H.R. 192 is a resolution. The Senate and House pass resolutions all the time. Resolutions are not law. Go and look at the rules on lawmaking. According to Congress, resolutions are not law. They never have been. Getting back to the economy that they created so that you all can have a better understanding of this, the economy was based on credit. Now, we talked the other day about how the banks issue personal loans based on your credit worthiness. This has nothing to do with your credit score. Your credit worthiness has nothing to do with your credit score. Your credit worthiness is whether you are a citizen of the United States of America or a state of the citizen of the state of the state of the United States, a citizen of the state of the United States, or if you are a citizen of one of the foreign states that uses the very same type of economic based system. Go back to the early 90s and see you didn't have a lot of people from foreign countries coming into this country on visas and staying and moving here. But after China became a part of the World Trade Organization, all of a sudden China was allowing its citizens to move to America and America was allowing them to move. And you know what? Like Japan, when individuals from Japan move here, they were given stipends. Not all of them. No, 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 because all of them didn't know how to get this. Quite a few of them were getting stipends because they knew, because of the people who brought them here, how to apply for that, to where they received credits from this government based on atrocities that this government has caused upon their people or upon their land, or as a result of incentives and breaks, as a result of deals made between the countries. China did not become a part of the World Trade Center, uh, World Trade Center, <laughs> World Trade Organization. I apologize if I said center earlier, and you can see how that mistake could be made. But the World Trade Organization, they didn't become part of the World Trade Organization for a long time for a reason, because they did not believe in the, you guys know the word for the economy that the United States created. They called it a capitalist society. They created capitalism. It's a belief-based system. And you have to buy into the system in order to benefit from the system. So ever since China became part of the World Trade Organization, has it not benefited from the system? The largest economy in the world, only second to whom? California, a 900-mile-long state. outranks all the other governments of the world and the economy it has. Imagine that. You would wonder what technology, movies, 
and vegetables could do for someone. That's California. Those of you who have never been to California know very little about California. California is 900 miles long. It stretches a long way. <laughs> okay. Just my going to the state capital takes four and a half hours to drive. It takes me two and a half hours to drive to Los Angeles, which is over 200 miles away. No, as a matter of fact, I just realized that it almost takes the same amount of time driving to Los Angeles as is Sacramento because it's almost the same amount of distance. Because of where I'm situated, there's no straight direction. I have to either travel 60 miles one way or 60 miles the other way to get to the freeways that will take me to Los Angeles. So that's just to let you guys know. Let's get back to this economy thing. You've heard of being a burden on society. Well, because they did the New Deal, every society, every state, every county has their own budget. These counties and these states, they get to invest in these budgets. Sorry, I am trying to pull this document up, and it, it is a very large document. It's a PDF. And this is taken from governmentinfo.gov. So govinfo.gov is where this is taken from. And it does talk about 1933. And I am waiting for it to pull up. But you see how slow it's going? So it's going to be a minute. All right. So in 1933, they had a crisis. And what you all didn't know, just like the letter that was given to the president, that letter was created months before he got elected. And when he got elected, the prior former president gave him the letter. And without missing a beat, the very same day, he takes the letter. If you guys thought he was a good man or anything like that, you're wrong. Because he takes that letter that came from the banks and he orders an emergency session of Congress because somebody was controlling things. His very first day in office, the first thing he does is issue a executive order in the form of what's known as a presidential proclamation. And that proclamation technically is federal law applying to all federal agents, employees, citizens, because they're under the ju uh, jurisdiction of that agency. And what did he do? He ordered that there was an emergency. And then three days later, he orders for a special convention of Congress to come together on the 9th. So on the 6th, there was Presidential Proclamation 2038. Then on the 9th, you have Presidential Proclamation 2039, where he introduces a new order. That new order talked about how they were going to do a banking holiday. That banking holiday is still going on. But I've read it and it says it's only supposed to be four days. Yes, but it was only supposed to be four days. But Congress has never, ever, ever, not ever, ever said that the president's request was unreasonable. No, what Congress said on the 9th was that we concur with the president's, pay attention, assessment. And we are now instituting the following act. And then in 1973, a Senate committee has determined that the president has never rescinded the proclamation. And that in 1976, they determined that the proclamation was still extant, still standing still enforceable. So again, we're still under the New Deal, the presidential proclamation. We're still under the New Deal. Interesting, ain't it? Now that we're under that New Deal, now you need to understand what the New Deal was. See, the New Deal was, we're going to take away your substance and we're going to give you credits. Here's the problem. The government couldn't give you credits because the government gets all of its credits from you. 
the government couldn't give you credits because the government gets all of its credits from you. So how do you get to use your credits to your benefit? Well, we showed you the other day when we were doing the video on trust and showing you how the federal government issues trust and they do trust all the time. We even created a document um, folder on our website and put those documents inside. And they gave you the government's definition of what a trust is. And their definition is slightly different than that of the official definition of what a trust is. And what they've explained that in their trust, they are both the beneficiaries and the grantors. And as the beneficiaries and grantors of the trust, they can decide when to amend, when to revoke, and so forth. Interesting, ain't it? They said that they are beneficiaries and the executors of the trust. Well, that's fine. There's not a problem. I don't have a problem with that. They want to be the beneficiary and the executor at the same time. Hey, by all means, they're people too. They have the right to do the same thing you have the right to do. So you're going to do the same thing. Those of you who get the new SAP packs, you're going to do the exact same thing that they did. You're going to become the beneficiary and the executor of the new trust. You're going to do the exact same thing the Treasury said they did because equal protection of law says that you have that right to do exactly that. No, you're not going to do it in anger. No, 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 no. You're going to keep everything going just the same. You see, because the government borrows, pay attention, borrows from you all the time, your full faith and credit, then what you're going to do is you're going to allow them to borrow from you, from your full faith and credit. And by allowing them to borrow your full faith and credit, you're going to create the terms for which this borrowing is to be done. And they're going to be reasonable terms. They're not going to be unreasonable terms. And you're going to appoint public servants as the trustee. Wait a minute. Appoint public servants as the trustee? Huh, they're already fiduciaries. So appointing them as trustees, they're already trustees. So I'm not doing anything illegal because they are already trustees. You're absolutely right. That's an interesting way of looking at it. Because these government officials are already trustees. See, a lot of people have been misunderstanding the Form 56. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to explain to you the Form 56. You have a straw person. You have a, and you heard me say the word straw person. Go ahead and look at the courts using the word straw man. You look at them using the word before 1999. Look at the definition in Black's Law Dictionary for a straw man that existed prior to 1933. They know what a straw man was when they created it. The all block capitals name, not the all caps name, the all block capitals name, all as an all black block letter capitals, all block letter capitals. They look like square little blocks, don't they? When you put them together. Just look at big huge square. Just look like letters, but it looked like a square because they're so even and right next to each other. It's called all block capitals. So they created that creature. He's a creature of the state. That entity. Oh, by the way, <laughs> that entity is never a female. Go ahead and take a look. They've never created that entity into a female. It's always been a he. It's an entity. You never hear them referring to the entity as a she. Yes, yes, yes. They'll use certain terminology, but go ahead and look at when they created it. It is usually in the gender of neither, but it's always referenced as a he. I am not making this up. You just need to go back and look. When they created it, they didn't create it with the understanding that women had, quote unquote, equal rights. Sorry, that didn't happen until the 60s, remember? So I just, just thought I'd give you guys a little bit of an education. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, we're in a situation where People are struggling. They're about to lose their homes and they don't know what to do. We're in a situation where the banks have charged off on people's accounts certain amounts and sent them 1099 C's for which they reported to the IRS that this person owes money. Ladies and gentlemen, if you did a 1099 C and do not shy away from it, you'll have to send it to the IRS. You'll have to add it to your taxes. And guess what? When you do so, the IRS will have to investigate the amount of currency. This particular agent was a little bit 
fearful of doing any type of tax claim against the government. I wanted to explain to her, look, you're not doing any claim against anybody. This ain't you. Well, she's saying that she didn't want to really get involved until she did more research. No problem. You're not doing it for me. But And I explained to her my situation. I said, I'm taking full responsibility for my taxes, even though they're being done by someone else. I told that person to put all the weight on me. First, I trust this person. I know this person. I didn't just bring this person on board yesterday. This person and I get along just very well. And I like this person as a person person. You know what I mean? Because, you know, we person. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, after talking with this agent and seeing that she had the wrong concept, I explained to her, do you understand that the Supreme Court has said the United States gets to engage in contracts the same as any other person? And in doing so, they get treated as any other ordinary corporation? See, they can't be represented by the United States Attorney General's office because that's a breach of protocol. Because according to the United States, the Attorney General can only represent the interests of the United States. Well, the corporation being treated as any other individual corporate uh, party, then they can't represent the interests of the United States. It really is that simple because they are now treated as any other ordinary corporation. That's how simple it is. They don't want to have that argument. But as I told the person that I was speaking with, let them have that argument with me. It's not an argument I'll shy away from. Uh, see, this is June 12th. I want it. See, this is the congressional record, the Senate June 12th. And I didn't want June 12th. I want it June 5th and 6th. But as I told you, getting that information, it isn't like it used to be. Okay? Getting that information, it used to be right there in front of you, and that's what this one said. I'm going to do the June 12th thing. Okay, I am going to highlight June 12th, but this is just me letting you guys know, and then I will eventually get this online, so those whoever's interested in it, uh, because you might find some interesting points in the conversation, because even this act, and let's see, uh, for unanimous consent on reading the journals for the calendar days of June 9th and June 10th, was dispensed with and the journal was approved. Uh, I don't see anything in there that would be of any reference to anything important yet, but I'm not reading it because you guys saw, as I saw, that this is my pulling it up for the first time. Don't know why Senate was separated by underscores. Okay. So uh-oh, there is something in this that shouldn't be. And now I got to find out where it is. Oh, there it is right there, congressional record. All right. It doesn't like the uh, colons. All right. So getting back to the economy, as I said, they created this for you all. Technically, it wasn't created. It was for you all. It was created so that they could manipulate the economy the same way they had been doing it. And the fact is, government officials are aware of this. Go back and see even John, uh, is, it, is it John? See, I don't know why I can't ever remember Trafficant's uh, name, but even when he was alive and he was a senator, he brought this up on the Senate floor and nobody did or said anything about it. It's a good thing his tractor ran over him. Yeah, I, I have no idea how his tractor ran over him when he was sitting inside the tractor, but his tractor ran over him. Uh, flipped over and everything. It was amazing. Yep, at least that was the story. But if that was the story, that was the story. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my hope that some of you, those of you who are facing foreclosure, will start to realize that first, if you have a debt and it's a foreclosure debt, you do know you get to write off that debt. Do you not know that? So how come you haven't been writing off that debt? Ladies and gentlemen, if you started using the accrual method, you could write off that debt. You could balance your books. This nation is only interested in the books being balanced. 
that's your chiming. If there is somebody who needs to bring something to someone's attention, you just tell them that I am just here to help reduce the public debt and reduce my burden on the public debt. And that's why I'm presenting you my balanced book because you're asking me to do the accrual method in order to do that. And so I'm going to use the accrual method from now on and I'm going to do a corrective filing if need be. Yes, some of you, it's going to take you some time. You got to put some paperwork together. You got to do some research. Well, then let that be your focus. Don't worry about anything else. Don't focus on anything else. Focus on that. The problem is too many of you are doing too many things. You're trying to multitask. We are not creatures who are designed to multitask. Do not let anybody tell you that we were somehow designed to multitask. That is a lie. We were not designed to multitask. Focus, focus, focus on one thing at a time. Everybody is told to focus. We even had someone who told you to keep your eyes simple on one thing at a time, ladies and gentlemen. Stop trying to do everything. You cannot do everything. That's why you're not accomplishing anything. Stop trying to do everything. The new contracts, we'll be putting up some more videos involving the new contracts. Um, those of you who have gotten the contracts prior to this morning, you received a paragraph that you need to amend. There's only one other person that we have to send that to. It's just a simple paragraph that you're just going to add to the contract. It is important because it covers the whole contract, but it also protects the whole contract in you so that nobody can sit up there and think they got the right to construe the contract or imagine what the contract says. Okay, that paragraph takes care of that. So all of you should be getting a copy of that. And with that being said, it is an hour and 11 minutes that this video has taken place. And so we're going to try to get this up to you guys as soon as possible. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to us here at this location. We do appreciate it. We ask that you have a very good day. Have a good day, everyone. Goodbye.